Hi, in this video, we're going to go over model specification and logistic regression models. All right, so model specification is making decisions about what model we're going to run with. All right, so specifically the predictor variables that we're going to include, which ones we're going to exclude, how we're going to have those variables in there. Are we going to have like square root transform, the straight value, quadratic, polynomial, and also the possibility of interaction terms. And so we'll also go ahead and talk about uh, stepwise selection, forward, backwards, and forward back. And we'll look at lasso also. All right, so let's dig into it. All right, so first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to load my data. All right, so I'm going to be using the SA Heart data set from the Elementary Statistics Learning Package. All right, so here we have uh, uh, chronic heart disease as the target variable. And you know I'm going to do this light data prep is I'm going to convert the presence of family history for heart problems to be a binary vector of zeros and ones instead of having uh, the uh, two different levels of categorical. So I'm going to go ahead and make the dummy variable myself. All right, now something about this data set or this package I should say, is that at the current version, I couldn't load onto my machine. So I went ahead and used DevTools package to install an old version of it. All right. All right, so model specification is defining and constructing the logistic regression model. Uh, like really it's, you know, we're focused on making the decisions on what's gonna be in the model and what's not. So everything that really that we do up until, so after we have our data, but before we fit the model, so up until fitting. And so, you know, we're gonna have some critical decisions that will impact our model's performance and interpretability. All right, so uh, first thing I wanna talk about is our mathematical notation, our so logistic regression. What we're gonna do is that we're going to sit, make the assumption that the correct model is of the form of these add-ins, that is predictor variable times coefficient plus predictor variable times coefficient. Keep on going, keep predictor variable times coefficient plus an intercept term is equal to the log odds of success. So remember in, in statistics, we denote a success as a one, a failure as a zero. And what we're really interested in is the probability, but mathematically getting to the probability is not as easy as getting to the odds. The odds, you will be going over a much wider range of possible values. You know, so it'll be going, you know, from, you know, super close to zero possibly all the way up to, you know, infinite you know, on, on the open, positive, the open interval of positive numbers. And so here, that is the odds here. That is the probability of success divided by the probability of failure. And then I'm going to take the logarithm that will convert that uh, to negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, so I've got the entire range of possible values. All right, so, so think about for a moment, potentially after I fit my model, if I was to, you know, have particular values for my x, let's say I, I observe an x value that's very large every time I have a negative coefficient, very small every time I see a positive coefficient or zero uh, for the predictor, then I could have a negative value on the right. And if I think about that for a moment, well, that couldn't jive with the odds by itself. And so that's why I need the logarithm around it to, to be able to fit this. And you know this has a nice interpretation. There's algebraically, it's very you know very clean. We can gain some inference off of it, and we'll talk about that in another video. All right. So now, feature selection. Feature selection is a big deal in all aspects of machine learning, all aspects of it, regression modeling, categorical machine learning, anything like that. Feature selection is critical. So we're going to go through the process of selecting predictor variables to include. In our model and predictor variables to exclude kick out from our model. And so what we're going to try to do, we're going to try to get the best model we can with our predictor variables. Now something about best, if I use different criteria to measure the model, I'll come up with slightly different, you know, op, slightly different models as being optimal, being the best one I can get. And so 
uh, as you work through, if your coworker chooses one criteria and you try, you choose another, you may get different models off of the same criteria. Be mindful of that when you go through your selection process. All right, so the first thing I wanted to consider when I'm doing feature selection is that I'm gonna be using subject matter knowledge for it. All right, so subject matter knowledge, hopefully I have it. If I don't, hopefully my stakeholders have it. I've been in a situation where they have and they have not, um, depending on the project. And so, you know, just talking with the, the stakeholders, seeing what's important to them, seeing what they believe to be correct in the data, you know, and it, it might be that they absolutely must have certain predictor variables in there. And all my decisions after that are going to be, as, you know, building models with those particular uh, predictor variables in there. Sometimes the my stakeholders say, hey, these are probably in there, but maybe not guaranteed. And, and so, and sometimes I've had uh, stakeholders who just have no idea whatsoever, and it's up to me to figure it out. All right, so, you know, I want to use, you know, uh, you know, domain knowledge, experience with, you know, possibly with building other models on similar projects, and to, just to figure out, like, you know, what, what, are, what are the insights that could be gained? Also, something that could come up is by working on similar projects, maybe my domain, you know, experience tells me that these two predictor variables are highly correlated. And so that means if they're highly correlated, I'm going to be very prone to kicking one out. So let's say we have like shoe size and height are our predictor variables. Well, those are very correlated with each other. And, you know, for me knowing that, I, I can anticipate that I'm going to want to kick out, you know, one, maybe both of them from the model. Also, we can look at what prior research has done. Maybe someone's already built a similar model and I can, you know, basically just try to copy and paste what they're doing and see if that's a, a good way to go. Uh, so that can give me guidance on what, what to choose and what to exclude. Also, if I have like a deeper understanding of the causal aspect, so let's say like, um, you know, I, you know, like we, we, we understand that like, you know, we're talking about fatal car crash as, you know, our, our target variable. And, you know, we could j just understand that speed is going to be one of the things, you know, in, in the car crash that, you know, just a faster car hitting at something else is more likely to produce a fatality, you know, from, you know, we see that cause and effect. And then there's also practical, practical considerations that, you know, it, it might be that I can't trust the data, even though I know that this is a, this should be a good uh, predictor variable to use. It might be that when I look at it, it's got errors, it's got problems, it's got missing values, it's polluted to the point where I just can't trust it, I have to throw it out. And so then I have to, you know, I have to do that. Also, we want to avoid redundancy. And, and so, like, if we were to measure, let's say, somebody's, you know, height and their shoe size, we're really measuring a person's size overall in terms of, like, their, their length. And, and so, highly correlated variables are going to have redundant information in them. We don't want redundancy in there. We want the simplest model that we can get that will be effective for our goal. Now, also, something we're going to need to consider are project goals. So my stakeholders might say, I absolutely must have certain predictor variables in there. I've been in this position. I've been in the position where I saw, you know what? That predictor variable is crud. Maybe it's polluted. Maybe uh, I can't trust it. Maybe there's too many missing values. You know, a whole slew of possible problems. But my stakeholders absolutely think it must be in there. Uh, I've, been in this, I've been in this position several times. For my humans, my human resources work, where legally I have to keep these predictor variables, even though I can look at the data and say, hey, that variable should be kicked out. Hey, that these two variables are correlated with each other. I should at least kick out one. I'm still stuck with it because of the requirements of the project. All right. So first thing we want to do, we want to use like adult supervision to select the best you know, predictor variables happen, possible. And generally what I like to do, I like to get it down to like a short list. And I'll, I'll get down to you know a, a, a short list of candidates, uh, kind of like in a job interview process. And then you know, get, get down to a list. And then I'm gonna start like working on like 
you know, filtering things out and removing things. Uh, frequently, I'm going to turn to correlation to help me guide, to help guide me on what to kick out, what, what's redundant with each other, or I'll use stepwise selection or lasso to do feature selection for me. All right, so stepwise selection, we've got three versions. The first one is forward selection. All right, so forward selection, we're going to start with an empty model. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at every single predictor variable, and I'm going to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to evaluate it. Which one would be the absolute best predictor variable to have in the model? All right, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to put it into my model. So now I have a one predictor variable model. Now I'm going to look at all the other predictor variables left. I'm going to try and find which one would be the best one to add to the model I've already established. I'm going to take it. I'm going to add it. So I've got a two variable model. And then I'm going to do this again. I'm going to look at all the remaining predictor variables. And if one improves the model, I'm going to stick it in there so that I have three. And I'm going to keep on doing this until either I have no more variables to put in or I reach a stopping criteria. Typically, we will use uh, AIC, uh, Akaiki's information criteria, or BIC, Bayesian information criteria, and to see if we get an improvement. And so once we get to the point where adding a predictor variable would not improve the model, then I stop. Now, how do we do this in R? Well, the most common way, by far the most common way to do this is to use the mass package uh, step AIC. And we specify the direction as forward, which is the default one. Now here, trace, if I put in zero, I'm going to get uh, very little information out, uh, only errors, honestly, or uh, you know problems. If I have a very large value, it's going to spit out all the details of what went through. So trace of zero is minimum information possible. Large value, which I have here of a million, is they give me a lot. And now here, I put it on BIC. BIC, the Bayesian Information Criterion, takes the log of the number of observations used in building the model as the penalty parameter. All right, so here, so here is the initial model that we have. We have everything available is included in there. Now I'm going to run uh, forward selection. Okay, so for this forward selection, it actually went with, I believe it is the whole model. Hey, isn't that interesting? That's not, okay, I was hoping it would be a little bit juicier than this, but it's not. Yeah, so here, forward selection decided to keep all predictor variables in there. And here we can see the AIC in there. Now, backwards elimination goes in the opposite direction. Forward selection starts with an empty model and adds a predictor variable one at a time. Backwards elimination takes the full potential of predictor variables, let's say like this, and then removes a predictor variable one at a time until we get our best possible model by this process. And so, you know, we start with a model that includes all predictor variables, and then we iteratively remove one variable at a time. And so we look to see at, on each step, what is the best model to be removed? And if that would improve the model by the criteria that I've set, then that variable is eliminated. Now, AIC and BIC, BIC will be more prone to having fewer predictor variables, while AIC will be more prone comparatively to having more predictor variables because of the size of the penalty. Now, between forward selection and backwards elimination, forward selection is faster when I have big data, or especially if I have a lot of predictor variables. If I have a lot of predictor variables to, to wade through, forward selection will be much faster than backwards elimination, because backwards elimination starts out by fitting a whole bunch of, you know, fits, you know, models using a lot of predictor variables. And so to implement this, I do exactly the same thing, but now I put direction equals backwards. And you can see that I'm using BIC on this. All right, and so now how it goes through this process, we start with the full model and then it tries removing uh, systolic blood pressure, tries removing tobacco, 
uh, LDH, then it's try to remove. So you notice the negative sign is removed. If there, if I was doing forward selection, it would be a plus sign for for adding the predictor variable in. So remove, remove the predictor variable, remove alcohol, remove age. All right, and so after it did that, it went through this and it saw that hey, this is our baseline model of not removing any variables. Here, this is the AIC of removing family history, AIC of removing age, AIC of removing type A. AIC of removing tobacco, moving LDH, removing obesity, systolic blood pressure, uh, fat tissue, and removing alcohol. And we can see that we get the best AIC if we remove alcohol. All right, so you'll notice now alcohol is no longer in the model. Let's do it again. All right, so now we're going to go through and we're going to see if we can improve the model by removing each of the predictor variables. All right, and so now that we've done that, here's our model that has everything except alcohol. And you know we have all of our AIC. We notice that adiposity tissue would be the best one to remove. Now notice that adiposity tissue and obesity are gonna be highly correlated with each other. So it's not surprising that this one is the one to be removed. So, uh, here, removing ad adipose tissue or removing obesity really would correspond to, hey, we have redundancy in the predictor variable. Let's get rid of one of these. While removing alcohol would be an indication that it's just less informative. And there's also a possibility that it's, it's correlated with what uh, we've got going on with the other predictor variables. So let's get rid of adipose tissue. All right, so now our, our formula is getting simpler. Let's do it again. And so we're gonna remove systolic blood pressure, tobacco, LDL, family history, type A. Now each time with this, all of the other predictor variables are in here. So when I'm on this step here, all of these predictor variables are being considered. When I'm on this step here, the only thing removed is tobacco. When I'm on this step here, the only one removed is LDL. When, on this step, only family history is removed, and so on, all the way down to age, where we have all of these predictor variables are in the model, age is removed. All right, so now we see, hey, so systolic blood pressure should be removed. All right, now systolic blood pressure correlates with obesity, so there's a high likelihood that obesity actually captures the relative information. I don't need adipose tissue. I don't need systolic blood pressure included in the model. And you'll notice that it just keeps on getting a little bit simpler every time I do this. So let's do it again. All right, so now, holy cow, look at this. We're getting rid of adipose tissue altogether. Wow, okay. So we've got tobacco, type A, LDL, family history, and age. And so any informative value that was present in the other predictor variables is being captured by these instead in some kind of higher dimensional correlational aspect, probably. And so now I've got the, the model to be, you know, it's looking simpler. So we're going to go through again. And this time, I notice that every time I remove a predictor variable, I get a result worse than the model I started with, So or my current model. So here, this is my current model. Every time I remove a predictor variable, I get a worse AIC. So I'm going to stop. I'm done. I am not going to run elimination anymore. And so this is my final model. Hey. And so now I can interpret this and figure out what's going on. Now, forward back selection. This is forward selection where after a few steps, we do backwards elimination to make sure I made the right call. And so we're going to start uh, by... So here we're starting by with the full model, and then we're going to remove predictor variables. And so I'm starting with the full model. My only option is to get rid of stuff. So just like before, we're getting rid of alcohol. Now what we're going to do is as I go through, I am going to 
consider removing all the predictor variables that are available, notice the negative sign, but I'm also gonna double check to make sure I made the right call on alcohol. And when I do that, you'll notice I've got the plus sign here. So anytime that there's a plus sign, that indicates I'm adding a variable that I didn't already have. And so we can see that removing adipose tissue is once again the right call. So let's go ahead and do that. Now I'm gonna go through and you'll notice that I'm removing, 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 removing all the way down on this model here. Here's, here's the model I've got. I'm removing all these predictor variables, but then when I get to alcohol and adipose tissue, I'm plugging them back in to see did, you know, in case I missed something along the way. All right, and so here we can see the put it back in predictor variables. We're still concluding removing systolic blood pressure. Okay, so let's do that. And you know, we're going. So here's my current model. I'm going to go through and run through this. And now I'm going to remove obesity. Okay, so let's do that. And I'm going to do it again. So I'm getting the same results so far. I end up getting exactly the same model. It's possible that after I've removed several models, it might be one that I got rid of earlier. I might want to put back in because I got rid of the variables that were highly correlated with it. Forward back, we'll pick that up. All right, so stepwise selection has some advantages. It's automated. It's easy to understand for us. It's very systematic. Um, you know, it's a good way to make sure that, you know, I've got that all the variables in there are relevant by whatever criteria that I set. And it does a pretty good job of preventing overfitting. Um, now, disadvantages is that it's sensitive to the order in which the variables are uh, removed or added. And so, you know, if I had a change in data, it's possible that I would have, you know, removed a, removed a variable earlier than I did in this process. And by removing it earlier, it's possible that that would actually change other aspects of the model, depending on the collinearity between predictor variables. All right, now, it probably isn't gonna find the optimal predictor. So the optimal predictor if I was to go through uh, two to the power of P of all possible models, which can be very, very big, I can try and find the optimal model. Um, computationally, this is not a, the best possible model is not efficient to go after. Unless I have small data, I don't want to approach it. Uh, so just remember, there may be a better model lurking, but most of the time, honestly, in, in terms of like predictive performance, I haven't seen a big difference between the best possible model and a, a stepwise selected model. Also, this can be computationally intense, especially for backwards elimination with large data. Um, forward selection is a better choice uh, when I'm handling uh, large data sets. Now, the next one that I wanna talk about is LASSO, least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. What this does is that this puts a penalty term on the size of my coefficients. All right, now, when I do lasso, it's important that I, I, I uh, scale my data, my predictor variables, so that I have a constant standard deviation or constant range. In some manner, I, it's super important that you rescale your predictor variables or have them all on the same scale. I like to use uh, subtracting the mean divided by standard deviation. All right, so what is happening here is that this is a modified, using logarithms, this is a modified computation of the likelihood of our model. So after I fit it, I have a likelihood uh, measurement. Higher likelihood means it's a better model. All right, so here, big is good. Now, what's gonna happen here? This lambda is positive, and this is gonna be all positive numbers. What's happening is I'm taking the sum of the absolute value of my coefficients and I'm multiplying that by a penalty term here. Notice I'm subtracting off. And so what I want to do, I want these, this whole thing to be as large as possible. So I'm considering the likelihood 
aspect, which is a measurement of fit, but I'm also considering the size of the coefficients. And what this does is prevents overfitting for us. And what will happen is that when I use absolute value here, predictor variables that are not informative, not useful, redundant, are going to get a coefficient of zero. And so then the a coefficient of zero means it's got I got kicked out. I don't have to worry about it. And so this is an easy way for us to do variable selection. All right, so this performs an automatic feature selection for us by driving out coefficients to zero. If you, as you increase the lambda, you know, frequently what will happen is as lambda gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the coefficients are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until, you know, they potentially get to zero. Once they're zero, get rid of the predictor variable. All right, this does a good job of mitigating multicollinearity. Now, what can happen here with multicollinearity is that correlated variables will, can stay in the model, but both of their coefficients are reduced, but still present, but with, you know, with non-negative numbers. And, you know, this is going to be easier to interpret than, you know, other possibilities because I'm, I, I could potentially kick things out. Uh, it will be harder to interpret when I, when the model maintains correlated variables with each other. Now, disadvantage, the choice of the penalty, you know, requires tuning. That's extra work, extra computations. I'm effectively building models I'm not going to use. Uh, this won't perform very well when many variables have small but non-zero coefficients. And so what can happen, what I'm, I'm saying there, is that we have very, very small coefficients that should be in there, but it's potentially getting kicked out because of the, the penalty aspect, not because it should be kicked out. And also, and this is true for, for the stepwise selections also, we can get biased coefficient estimation. And so this is important to be mindful of. Uh, something that we can do potentially is use lasso to do feature selection and then refit the model using maximum likelihood instead of lasso if we're really worried about this. All right. So now what I'm going to do is just give you an example. I'm going to use the GL, GLM net package. And here's my data. So here's my predictor variables. Now the GLM net requires a matrix. So if I have categorical data, I have to convert it over to uh, binary, my dummy variables. I have my target variable as a vector. Notice that this is a matrix. This is a vector that I pull from there. Specify that it's logistic regression. And here, one is for lasso, zero is for ridge uh, modeling. So ridge will never push out the model. Ridge is a good choice when you're in that position where you have to keep all your predictor variables. Now here is the optimal lambda. I, before the video, I went through and I found the best possible bit lambda by the computations. And so now I've got my coefficients. Now, every time you see a dot here, that's an indication that the variable, the coefficient was shrunk down to zero. All right, and so now we have a simpler model. So this is another way to perform variable selection. And you'll notice that we end up having very similar, if not the same, predictor variables in our model. Now, something that we also need to talk about is selecting the functional form in there. And, and so it might be best to do a transformation on our data. So ex for example, let's say I have highly skewed data that's all positive values. I might want to use a logarithm. Now we can also use a square root. Frequently square roots will be useful when we have count data. That's because of a relationship with the, uh, the expected value and the standard deviation of, of the Poisson distribution. We can also use the box cost transformation when the uh, x, when the predictor variable is positive, if lambda is equal to zero, that in the limit is equivalent to logarithm transformation. And then there's also Yo Johnson transformation, which conceptually think about it as box cock, but able to allow uh, some zeros and negative values. It's it's piecewise defined. It's different than box cocks, but think about it conceptually as box cocks but for a wider range of values. 
And so I can consider using logarithms and square roots. And notice here, to make sure I have positive values, I chose, so I looked at the data, I went, hey, that looks highly skewed to me. I think I should do a logarithm on that, but I had zeros in there. Add one, boom, everything is positive. And now to do the box box transformation, my favorite way to do that is with the caret package preprocess function. And so here I just put method equals box box. Now something funny about this is that this function doesn't not it does not transform my data. It builds a function to transform my data. And to actually transform it, I have to use the predict function where I pass my predictor variables into the predict function. Now for Yo Johnson, it's the same thing I, with the carrot package once again, but now instead of box cox, which I have here, I have Yo Johnson. And you know I have to use predict to get the transform values. And here I'm only applying it to tobacco, which has, has zeros in there. So now I'm going, I went through and did variable selection before the video. And you'll notice that now I have LDL in there and I have the box box of type A as the model that I'm going to use. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is interaction terms. For interaction terms, that's where the slope or the intercept uh, relative to what's going on uh, changes uh, by the value of the other. So if I, if I have a fixed value, say x2 is fixed, then the slope of x1 actually depends on the value of x2. The slope of x2 depends on the value of x1, depending on how you look at it as which one's fixed, which one's not. And this is a mistake. I, I will have to fix this. All right, so to have an interaction term in R, we use a colon in here. So this is the manual formula, you know, way of entering what we have. So here I have just a predictor variable and coefficient, predictor variable and coefficients. And then here I'm manually saying, give me an interaction term. I will get all of this if I was to do LDL family history with, instead of a plus, just the star in there. And so we can shorten it up you know, kind of nicely. Now, higher order terms for the predictive variables, we can do polynomial regression here if we want. I personally shy away from polynomial regression uh, most of the time, but here I have degree one term for the predictive variable, degree two for the same predictive variable. Next would be degree three, degree four, all the way up to degree P. And I have a coefficient at different coefficient times of each one. So now, I can go through and I can run this. Now, there's, there's two different major ways to go about getting a polynomial regression model. I can specify it using the identity function and a, an exponent. That will work. Or I can use orthogonal polynomials. If I use the poly function in R, it will automatically do orthogonal polynomials for me and make it nice and easy for me. And you'll notice here that the predictor variable in this presentation is not the individual like power of it. It's actually the orthogonal polynomial. So we've got two orthogonal polynomials going on. One is degree one, the second one is degree two, and we have coefficients times the entire polynomial. All right. So for homework, I want you to go through, I want you to build all the, the models I've got here, the formulas, uh, using the data that you've got, whatever data you're, there, you're interested in, whatever data makes you excited, take that data and then go through and use these formulas to start fitting models. And then I want you to go through and decide which one is best. All right, well, that's all I've got for you. Life is short, do math.